Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tert and I'm going to be talking to you about a programming language. Um, a programming language that is not Rust, uh, but I'll explain why that makes sense anyway. I hope that will be clear at the end of the presentation. Right, uh, ooh, that was two slides. Um, so this is me. Uh, I am a software engineer at Analnet Labs, and I am also an organizer of the Rust Week conference. Um, a little bit more about Analnet Labs. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization, so we just give away our code for free, um, free and open source. Um, and you know, the organization has been around for 25 years. I wasn't around back then. I'm 26, so I would have been very, very small if I was around by that time. Um, we are focused on uh, internet protocols, DNS, and routing. Um, and you might know some of our uh, products: um, NSD, Unbound, and Routinator. If you don't, don't worry, that's fine. Um, historically, all of these products have been written in C. However, uh, a couple of years back, we discovered Rust, and now all our new products are in Rust. Uh, this includes the um, DNS sec signer called Cascade, and some other products called Krill, Routinator, and importantly for this presentation, also Rotonda. Rotonda is a BGP collector written in Rust. Um, and all you need to kind of know about that is it's a highly specialized, super fast database for one specific kind of data um, uh, that my colleagues spend a lot of time highly optimizing. Um, and we want people to be able to deploy this database and then customize what, cu what is being stored inside and what comes out when you query it. So that looks something like this. We have our store, which is the database, and then we have uh, lots of inputs that will be sending us some data that should be going through some filters um, before it gets stored, and then when you query it, it also should go through some filters uh, into the outputs. Um, the users should be able to specify what these filters are. But how? What do they write these filters in? Which language do we give them to you know, customize this behavior? So we looked at some possibilities, um, some scripting languages, some specific filter languages, some other things. And we kind of found that they weren't up for the task. We want this thing to be very reliable and very fast. Um, and also to give people the full power of a full programming language instead of a constraint filter language. So they were either too constrained, too slow, or dynamically typed because they didn't have a type checker and only, you know, they, they only report things at runtime, but we want more reliability. So, you know. Being the completely sane developers that we are, we made our own. Uh, <laughs> we made our own uh, programming language, uh, and that is Roto. So Roto, in a nutshell, here's what you need to know. It is embedded in a Rust application. So you build your Rust application, and then you can uh, expose bindings to Roto um, to have your, uh, make your application scriptable. Um, it is statically typed, unlike most of the other scripting languages, uh, for example, unlike Lua. Um, it features um, friendly error messages, try to put in a lot of time to making those really nice. Um, and it is sort of JIT compiled to machine code. Um, and what I mean with the JIT compiled here is not in the sort of JS Lua JIT kind. Um, we compiled the whole script beforehand and then we run it. So we don't do first interpreter, and then we optimize the hot paths to uh, machine code. We do the whole thing. So how do we do that? Well, there's this beautiful project out there called CraneLift. Um, you might have heard of, uh, about CraneLift for the Rust-C backend, the, cr the CraneLift backend for Rust-C. Um, CraneLift is a compiler backend, just like LVM. Uh, it has some different, makes some different trade-offs, but uh, crucially, it is a Rust crate, and I can uh, include it into my dependencies really, really easily, and it's great to work with. Um, it comes from the Wasm Time uh, project, uh, where they use it to um, 
compile and run wasm. Um, but we kind of use that uh, project. So Roto compiles to CraneLift IR, and then CraneLift takes care of the rest, compiles it down all the way to machine code. Um, and then it tells us, here's where your machine code is. So we have to pull some tricks. Um, this is the unsafest and safe that I've ever seen, uh, but we have to do it um, <laughs> to make this work. Uh, so <laughs> CraneLift just gives us a pointer and a buffer of code, uh, and then it says, well, there's your function. Uh, and then to be able to run that, we need to cast it to the proper function pointer type uh, and then call it. Isn't that great? Um, of course, this is super duper unsafe, um, but of course, something that you have to do if you compile to machine code. Um, we've had some troubles with that, but we fixed a lot of them. Uh, and I'm sure there will, be the, there will be some more issues, but we try to run uh, Valgrind on our entire test suite uh, so that we can be at least fairly sure uh, that there's no double freeze or use after freeze happening here. Um, that gives us this kind of hand wavy speed chart. Um, I um, omitted the numbers from this because, well, it's really, really hard to benchmark an entire language. Uh, and also, it, it will always be unfair to, to, to something. Um, but hand wavily, uh, this is roughly what we see, is that we uh, outperform uh, Lua on many tasks. Um, uh, somebody's actually been running this in production. Uh, both with a Lua implementation and a Roto implementation, and Roto is always significantly faster. Um, so now you might be wondering, what does it look like? Well, it looks a lot like Rust. Um, we like Rust. We think it makes a lot of good syntax decisions. Uh, so why not steal some of them? Um, it uses Fn. It has the same uh, function signature um, kind of syntax, uh, but then we start, no start to notice some small differences. Um, so we have a print function, not a print or a print line macro. And then that function takes an f string, uh, just like you might expect from Python. Uh, and this f string can also evaluate more complex expressions. Uh, so you could also write like x plus 2 inside of the f string. Um, and then we just have a normal if expression, and uh, we also have the implicit return uh, from Rust. So let's say we store this script in a file called, I don't know, script.roto, and then um, we want to use that. Um, what we have to do is we create a roto runtime, we tell it to compile the script, uh, we get the function out with the proper type, uh, so we get a properly typed function, and roto will do all the necessary checks uh, that this is actually the correct function type. And then we call dot .call. Um, and we get an answer out. Um, if we were to make a mistake, um, for example, uh, here, you might already see what's wrong. We're assigning a float to an integer. That, that, can't, that can't be right. Um, we have to throw an error here. So this is what an error in Roto looks like. Um, we just say, we expected an i32 value here, but hey, we got a float. Um, another example of an error message is, let's say we have two define the same function twice, the same name. Um, we can't do that, so we show where you made the error, the second function, but we also show where the previous declaration was that it conflicts with. Um, now, so we've made a, a simple script. Um, but that's not giving Roto the full power of your own application yet. Um, we do that reg with registration. So with registration, you can expose your own types, your own functions and methods and constants uh, to Roto. And here's how that works. Um, so first, um, note that we're using a VEC3 type that just comes from a crate. Uh, this is the, the GLAM trait that implements some linear algebra things. Uh, so this is a vector three, which is like a is like a linear algebra vector, right? Not the Rust vec type, but a linear algebra vector with like a, a, an x, y, and a z component. Then we use this library macro um, to declare those things to Roto. So we say um, we're making a Roto type vec three, 
Um, and that corresponds to the Rust type val of vec3. Val here is just a new type that we need for you know, type system reasons uh, to ensure all the safety things. Um, and we also mark it as copy. So we can safely copy it around uh, without any trouble. Um, and that annotation also requires that the type implements the copy trait. And then we just also, still in the library, we can just declare more things. So we declare an impl block um, where you can uh, then create a, a method for the type that we've just declared. Uh, and we can use normal method and function syntax here. Um, and then uh, that function, the, the, or that method, x, will be available in Roto. So we then create a runtime, not new this time, but from lib, and we pass it this lib uh, variable. Then uh, we can write this Roto script um, that just uses the vec3 type and uses the x uh, method on it. Uh, and that just works. Um, like this, right? We can just compile the script, get the function. Uh, the types in this case are invert, um, but still statically typed. Uh, and then we pass it uh, two of those vector threes, and then we get an answer out. Uh, there's only two restrictions to this. Um, all of these types that you register, they need to be static and clone. Uh, they need to be that mostly because, uh, mostly as part of a design decision. We want Roto to be fairly you know, simple to pick up, at least kind of simpler than, uh, than Rust. Uh, so we don't have any references uh, and lifetimes and, and those kinds of things. So these values are freely copied around um, to make them easier to work with. Uh, so that's why they need clone, and also they, they can't then borrow any data, so they also need to be tick static. Uh, if you can't do that, at least the clone requirement, then you can wrap them in RC or ARC and sort of share them uh, and make them cheaply clonable there that way. Uh, crucially, there's no serialization happening. I don't need to know anything about how I need to serialize these types because I'm not doing that. Um, this is like, a, it's a very low overhead uh, interface to Rust. Right, insert demo here. Um, so here I have some rotocode. This is big enough for you. Yeah? Good, awesome. Um, I have some rotocode and I have a little demo which is a bevy app that you can see here on the left. Uh, the Bevy app is powered by Roto. So it will call into Roto on every frame. It will call the function above, the add function. And then for every frame, for every particle, it will call the second function to update every particle that we've already emitted. Um, so let's look at this function first. Um, it will just emit some particles with a function that we've provided to the script uh, to be able to emit that particle. This is all sort of particle and the vec3 and the color are all just exposed very simply uh, to Roto. And we can start changing this. So let's say um, we have this, this gradient of colors between like color one and color two. Let's zoom out a little bit. Um, we, so let's say we change one of these colors, right? There we go. Um, <laughs> we, can, we can kind of hot reload. <laughs> Thank you. We can hot reload anything, uh, this entire script, uh, and, and just have that work. Uh, so we could, um, oh, we could do loads of things. We could shorten the lifetime, or we could uh, change any of the scale here. So currently, I'm doing the, the lifetime uh, squared for some reason, because I thought that looked better. Because I, but if I want to do that differently, I could just change any of the code, and it will recompile the entire thing. Uh, on the left there, you can see the, the sort of flame, or the frame uh, count, and you can see uh, if I hit save, um, how long it takes to recompile. There we go. There was like a few, like a little bit of orange there, but not much. Um, so it's actually pretty quick. Um, right, and then we can go look at what this looks like on the Rust side. Is is just most of it is this uh, library macro over here. Ooh. Sometimes Helix with a mouse is difficult. Um, there we go. Uh, so we have a library, and then we just have a, a, a function called emit, three types, some impulse for those types with very straightforward implementations. Um, and that just goes on, and this thing just, you know, 
kind of checks the latest modification time of the scripts, and then if there's a new version, it will recompile it. Um, so the integration here is actually very simple to do. All right. Um, we want uh, our users to be able to learn this language, of course. Uh, we are sh shipping this in a product, so they better be able to use it. Um, for that, we have a documentation website, uh, including a, a tool that will uh, look at the, all the functions and types that you declare, extract your documentation comments that you have for them, and then it will be able to um, create a website like this for you. So this is actually um, internally in Roto itself. I'm also using this macro to create this, um, to, to add these documentation comments and to extract all the, all the correct types here. Um, now, before I hype this thing up too much, um, there's a couple of things that are missing because it's a, it's a work in progress. Um, there's currently no lists which you, which you might really want, um, therefore also no for loops. You saw a while loop, at least in my, in, uh, in, in my demo, um, so that works. Uh, generics are also hard, and also you can't really uh, register anything with a generic, right? That just doesn't doesn't really work. We need to uh, tell Roto about concrete types. Um, and also, because it's a work in progress and we're still changing this a lot, um, I'm not making uh, much stabili stability guarantees. Um, but we do take this thing seriously, right? It's part backed by a nonprofit organization. Uh, it's an integral part of one of our major products. Um, and also, we are very dedicated to making this uh, free and open source, which it already like completely is. All uh, development happens uh, out in the open. Uh, everything we do at Analog Labs, actually. Um, now, <laughs> Eurorust made a mistake of letting a Rust Week organizer on stage. Um, so I, I did have to take this opportunity to tell you to come to Rust Week 2026, which will be in May. Uh, we had a blast last year, and we think next year will be a blast too. Uh, you can check the website there. All right, um, here's some links, some QR code that will bring you to the slides and, and other links. Um, and uh, you know, feel free to come up to talk to me uh, I'll be around the whole conference, um, and thank you for listening.